We are an open and affirming community of faith where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And what a wonderful joy it is to once again finally be gathered in the sacred space of our sanctuary. I wanted to share further joy that although this is just our first Sunday back here in phase one, the numbers continue to look so good that we will be at phase two in literally another two or three weeks in March. We will be gathering with even more of our church family and we will be singing. So I am very glad and give thanks to God that we are only a short few weeks away from even more normalcy in our congregational life. Speaking of our congregational life together, we do continue to have Wednesday evening adult Bible studies over Zoom. Those you can access either on your computer, your cell phone, or even an old-fashioned landline will work. We also continue to have Wednesday evening uh, prayer meetings at 7. And those are a time for anyone, friend, family, member to gather and just share where we're at this week and pray for one another. So I invite you to join us over the phone or computer every Wednesday evening. I want to give thanks to God for our volunteers who helped pack our Lenten blessing bags and our very faithful delivery volunteers who have delivered them. Or I should say are in the process of delivering them. If you have not gotten yours yet, you will, and I promise you it will arrive before Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday. So thank you and God bless all of those who have uh, continued to volunteer and help with that important ministry. We are continuing to collect for the last few days of February items from Manna on Main Street in Lansdale. We are still collecting breakfast items that cereal, pancake mix, as well as some toiletries, baby wipes, toothpaste, things like that. Any of those items can go in our donation bin outside of the church by our main entrance or on our mission table. We also, for our youth, are collecting homemade scarves for the homeless. So if you or someone you know is a crocheter or a knitter, please remember our youth as they are actively collecting scarves for the homeless. Finally, as I said, Lent is quickly upon us. The month of March is going to be full of uh, new activity and opportunities. We will be, uh, throughout Lent, gathering here in our sanctuary, and we will be having our Friday, Good Friday Tuesday, not today, our Good Friday Ten and Gray service at 7 p.m. That is 7 p.m. on uh, Holy Good Friday. And on Easter Sunday, we are offering not one, but two indoor services. All of that should be in your March newsletter. So if you haven't received it through email, watch for it coming in the post, or pick up a spare one here at the church. We also have Lent devotional guides, both small as well as large print. So feel free to take any of those with you um, and share them with your neighbors. Finally, just a gentle reminder that we do have folks worshiping with us virtually online this morning. So when we do our prayer requests and we lift one another up, I ask that we refrain from using last names or any details that might break confidentiality. Seeing as there are no other announcements, let's worship together on this beautiful Sunday in February. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of this, when unveiled faces are being transformed. Seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, we are changed into the same image from one 
degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. We all reflect God's divinity and shine God's love to each other. Here, these 
words. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain, the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin on his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron, and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with God, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil back on his face again until he went to speak with God. Their gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 26. Hear these words. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed away, they saw the glory and the two men who stood with Jesus. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my Son, my Chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days, they told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I said, today is a very special Sunday in our Christian liturgical calendar. It is Transfiguration Sunday. And perhaps some of us are more accustomed lately to celebrating it earlier in February, but we are reminded that our Christian liturgical calendar is based on the lunar cycle. And so we are here celebrating Transfiguration literally a few days before Lent begins. Now, Transfiguration, as we've heard, is one of the many important milestones in the life of Christ. Just two months ago, we celebrated Jesus' birth at Christmas. Not long after that, we remembered his baptism, and then his very first miracle in Cana. Remember when his mother Mary goaded him to make more wine to keep the reception party going? And as we know, with Lent literally days away, Jesus is going to go on to have more milestones. He is going to be crucified, resurrected, and even ascend to heaven. All are major events of significance in the life and the ministry of our Christ. But to all of those we add this Sunday, Transfiguration. Now, as you just heard, Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, they went to a mountain to pray. 
Now, Jesus' disciples, and likely Christ too, were weary. They had been followed all over by large crowds that dogged them at every turn, wanted miracles and teachings. The disciples had just seen Jesus feeding thousands with only a few loaves and fishes. And on top of everything else, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem and was talking about terrifying things like arrest and death. As I said, those disciples, and likely Christ himself, were tired. We heard how tired they were that sleep was upon them. I think many of us could probably relate. I would be lying if I said I am not weary. Your pastor is feeling burned out, as I'm sure many of you are. It is a universal experience I think we are all having after two years of regulations, social conflict, COVID, fears about illness, fears about finances. All of that makes trauma. And we are tired, just as the disciples were tired. But Jesus knew what to do. He decided to take some time away, go up a mountain, and pray. And we see Jesus do this self-care so often. We'll see it again on Monday, Thursday, during Holy Week, when Christ, after having the Last Supper, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, to deal with all of the fear, frustration, and angst that he was feeling. So today, he goes up a mountain, bringing Peter, James, and John with him. And as we heard, Jesus begins to shine with bright light. Then we've got the prophets. We have Moses and Elijah showing up, appearing to speak with Jesus. And then, of course, Christ is called Son by a disembodied voice in the sky, we assume to be God, just like at Jesus' baptism a month ago. This is a moment of huge significance. The transfiguration not only supports Jesus' identity as the Son of God, but in that statement, listen to him, God identifies Jesus as God's messenger and mouthpiece. Now, as I said, Elijah and Moses, despite being dead hundreds of years, are there too. Nevertheless, God says, listen to Jesus. We have in Moses representing the law, the commandments, those ten commandments brought down from the mountain. And in Elijah, such a great prophet, representing the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures. But God says, listen not only to them, listen <coughs> to my son. And then what happens to Jesus is no less incredible. In some sermons in the past, I've talked about Jesus' metamorphosis, how he is transformed, his face physically changes, he sort of glows. And we don't know exactly what it means that his face changes, but it's depicted in all of our Gospels. Matthew says Jesus' face shone like the sun. Mark notes that even Jesus' clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could reach them. We heard today in Exodus that there is a biblical precedent for encounters with God changing a person's physical appearance. In today's Hebrew scripture, Moses climbed Mount Sinai to be with God and receive those Ten Commandments. Moses received the tablets directly from God, and once he descended from the mountain, the skin of Moses' face shown because 
he had been talking with God. And the glowing, it was so apparent that the Israelites were afraid of Moses to the point that he actually had to wear a veil over his face for the rest of his life. So yes, there is so much to ponder about what exactly happened to Jesus, the physical change that took place during the transfiguration, as well as the fact that it was such a significant milestone in Christ's life. But what stood out for me this year is once again the fact that the disciples were so tired and that Jesus, even Jesus knew he needed time away to pray. So they climbed up to a high mountaintop. Perhaps some of you enjoy getting away. Maybe you've been on a spiritual or church retreat. Or maybe it's just been a time that you've gone yourself up a mountain to a cabin in the woods or down to the seashore. Sometimes that time away, being separated, being in nature, allows us to have face-to-face -face time with God. And just as Christ was transformed on the mountaintop, we get transformed. Now, the mountain for Jesus, it was a symbol. It was the closest thing to the heavens and therefore God. And we see biblical characters retreating to mountains over and over. It was on Mount Moriah that God interacted with Abraham. Moses met with God and received the commandments on Mount Sinai. And then spoke to God again right before he died on Mount Nebo. Mount Horeb was where Moses saw the burning bush, where God intervened miraculously in his life. And of course, it was also where Elijah found God. Do you remember that one? Elijah went looking, listening for God. And God was not in the wind. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire, but in the sheer, small silence. Elijah also encountered God on Mount Carmel. The holy city of Jerusalem, the very place where folks believed God dwelled among God's people. Jerusalem was built on Mount Zion. And as we said, Jesus would retreat to the Garden of Gethsemane, right at the bottom of the mountain, when he really needed to connect and pray to be transformed spiritually by God. So what's the point? The point is that something very special, miraculous even, happened to Jesus that day up high on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. God was present. God spoke out loud and Jesus was changed. Not like prophets of old have been changed by spiritual encounters with God high above the towns and cities they normally frequent. And so too, how we can be changed. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean we all have the ability to rush out and climb a mountain this week. Perhaps our setting side of heart means just going to a quiet place in our home, finding five, ten minutes to also see God face to face. And granted, I don't expect that next week when we come back, that all of us are going to have glowing faces. But our hearts may just well be transformed. If you, like me, are weary, if you, like the disciples, are tired, seek out God. Whether on a mountaintop or in a back corner of your home, or right here in the sacred space of our sanctuary. 
Encounters with God can transform our hearts just as surely as they transformed Christ's appearance. Amen. Oh God, this day we ask for peace. 
peace in the name of Christ, your Prince of Peace. We ask that you hold in your hands those who lost their lives last night and every night on the street corners of Philadelphia. And we ask, O oh God, that you hold in your hands the lives of each and every Ukrainian and all of those who find themselves in harm's way this day. Lord, we pray these things, knowing that you are a God of transformation. And in the name of Christ, who taught us to stay together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. 